It's prepping. So now. Yay. Okay. I see it now. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Julie. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to KC Oasis. I'm going to be your MC today. I'm Genevieve. Um, we have a great lineup today. But before we get started, I tell you about them. You're probably curious. Uh, what's KC Oasis? Uh, we, uh, we believe that the human experience is better when it is shared. And we are so pleased that you chose to share it with us this morning. Um, we are a place where we can gather around our five values, which are people are more important than beliefs. Meaning comes from making a difference. Reality is known through reason. Human hands solve human problems and be accepting and be accepted. So our uh, lineup today is we have the musical guest Dylan Guthrie. I think he's been back um, before in the past. So um, some of you may know him, I think. And then our community moment, which um, we'll have in a little bit will be Michelle Shields or yeah, Michelle Shields. And then later today, we're gonna have guest speaker Emma Mortaboy from um, the UK join us. Uh, so uh, I wanted to say something real quick uh, because May has been kind of awesome for me and I hope that it's been awesome for you guys. I noticed this morning when I was feeling good about all the good things happening because life's changing for all of us now. Um, I don't feel guilty about the good stuff. So I hope that you're not feeling guilty about the good stuff too. I feel like we all deserve to um, have some pleasantry in our life these days. So if you're starting to feel that, that's great. Don't worry, no other shoe's gonna drop. All is gonna be well for a while, I think. Um, but yeah, I was just uh, wanted to pass that on. Hope you're feeling that way today. So uh, uh, to start, we're gonna have our first musical uh, performance from Dylan. I wanna tell you a little bit about Dylan first. Yes, hold on, here we go. Okay, so Dylan was born in Lawrence, Kansas. He's a singer and guitar player who's returned uh, stateside from Seville, Spain in 2020 and now resides in Kansas City. His music blends retro pop, classic rock, soul, and jazz into a rootsy melange. He is known for his soulful vocals and energetic persona. Trained in both classical and jazz music, Guthrie blends the sounds of past and current generations into his groove bass blend of feel good roots music. Oh boy, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to this. Um, so Dylan, are you ready to uh, give us some musical love? Hi, yeah, can y'all hear me? I'm uh, checking in here. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me on this. Uh, I don't know where everyone is. Maybe it's not dreary where everyone is, but uh, in Kansas City right now, be nice dreary. Uh, chill day. Anyways, but yeah, I'm ready to rock, so I'll just kind of get playing some tunes. Um, <clears throat> I'll play some original music. If I feel inspired, maybe I'll do a cover, but I'm going to play some some tunes here. This is uh, one that I wrote um, kind of like a few months into quarantine when I started being able to write music again after kind of feeling bad about things for a while. <laughs> I 
was having these thoughts to myself. They were too great for my health. But now I'm trying to get better at it. I follow Dante through hell. But now I put a hand that foot back on the shelf. Now I'm sleeping at night. I don't run from the light anymore. Nothing that you do, they're gonna come on back to you. So you might as well let her ride. Let her I suppose I'll play one more tune. I believe we start with two. So that is, yeah, that one's called Let It Ride. If you're familiar with Lawrence, Kansas, that one actually is kind of an homage, as it were, to the old skate shop in Lawrence. It was called Let It Ride. Anyways, uh, <laughs> but I think that's since uh, been, you know, it's gone, gone out of business or maybe it's rebranded or something as well. I think they might kind of exist in some capacity. Anyways, I, I, I don't skateboard anymore, but I used to as a kiddo. So that was an important part of my old childhood. Uh, but here we go. Let's do, I'll do one more tune. I'm going to, let's think here. I'm going to do this one. This one's called Hard Work. I wrote it actually in conjunction with a dude named Xiao Zhu, who was a drummer uh, who I was playing with in China, uh, in Dali, Yunnan. And he wrote this guitar part. Anyways, uh, and then I kind of extrapolated some more stuff. and. We have this song now. She's working hard, but she just won't say it. She knows that price, but she just won't pay it. She won't see your love like She'll never have a love like She don't understand what men they do to me. That she should take their hand and never show how to dance like She's got this friend and this fake name's Quavo. And she ain't right when he's not there, no. And she won't see your love. Yeah. 
she won't see our love life. She'll never have a love life. And she can't understand why men they will demand that she should take their hand and show them how to dance like Fantastic. That was super groovy. I hope everyone's giving Dylan some love. If you want to give extra love, you can look in the chat. Um, uh, Dylan's Venmo link is there. So feel free to tip generously. Um, Dylan, can you tell us about any upcoming events you have happening? Well, Genevieve, I'm glad you asked. I sure can. No, <laughs> I've got something this Thursday, actually. Um, we're doing a lot of kind of private parties and stuff, but I am doing a nice uh, public gig outdoors uh, at Caw Valley Public House in Lawrence, Kansas this Thursday. Um, so I'll be playing a bunch of original music with kind of a three-piece band, not really my normal group, but uh, still a really, really great group of musicians. A guy named Lucas Parker is playing, um, well, he'll be playing some guitar and bass with me, I think, actually, but his band's playing as well, as well as a really talented vocalist from Kansas City called Jessica, named Jessica Page. She was like on American Idol and stuff, even though that doesn't really describe her sound. She's more kind of, she's not as poppy as, as that might lead you to believe, but uh, for whatever that's worth. Anyways, Jessica Page, Lucas Parker, Dylan Guthrie, that's the bill, and it's, I think it's going to be around like seven-ish on Thursdays. Anyways, Lawrence, Kansas, Cobb Valley Public House. There you go. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much, Dylan. Um, Thank and thanks for your music so far. We'll see you in yeah. a little bit. So sure, I'll hang you. Guy. Okay, awesome. All right, so we're gonna move on to our community moment. Give me one second here. Do do do. All right. So um, if you don't know about community moments, I want to tell you about them for a second. Um, uh, do do do. Yeah. So a community moment is a chance for someone from our Co OASIS community to share something you've learned or share something about your journey through life and or even a favorite pastime. So if you are interested in sharing your story, uh, you can reach out to Mark Dixon. He's your guy. Um, as is tradition here at OASIS, um, uh, we have Melissa Shields today as our community moment and we asked her about three words that best describe her. And Melissa said, spoiled, funny, and outspoken. And we also asked about a war warning label and she said, proceed with caution. Okay, yeah, I like when they actually use the warning labels like that. I, yeah, I'm into that. Okay, so um, Melissa, we'd love to hear what you'd like to talk about and share with us today. Awesome, yay. Okay, so take it away. Thank you, Melissa. Oh, Michelle. Oh, did I get it wrong? Now I'm saying your name wrong. Are you, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Michelle, yes. Michelle, I'm sorry. Yeah, too many M's. Yeah, Michelle. Yeah. So, <laughs> Michelle. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for giving me a few minutes to talk about chickens. <laughs> um, so let's talk about backyard chickens. Um, this time of year, uh, Tractor Supply loads up with little baby chickens, and I see a lot of people um, want to get interested into it and find out what's, what's having backyard chickens like. And honestly, there's tons of benefits, like backyard chickens can help with pest control, they can help keep the weeds down in your backyard, um, and also provide you with breakfast. So um, with that, I wanted to just kind of talk about specifically egg laying chicken um, breeds, but, um, and also kind of dispel a few myths along the way about, you know, backyard chicken raisings. For, so um, first off, I, I supplied this picture here of some backyard chickens, and one of them is a rooster. And a common misconception is that, um, 
people think that you have to have a rooster in order to have eggs in your backyard flock. And that's actually not accurate, but roosters can play their role by protecting the, the flock, by helping forage for food and treats, which um, can be very handy, but for a lot of places you can't have roosters in your flock. And there's also some things to think about in your future plans maybe for having a backyard flock is that not every chicken necessarily makes a great egg laying chicken. So for example, these are meat chickens. I believe these in the picture are Cornish crosses. And what they're made to do is to gain a lot of weight very rapidly so that they can be processed for the purpose of meat um, in and about four to six weeks, which means that they don't really make for a very good pet in your backyard. But more importantly, the way that they physically stand um, and their build kind of makes it um, difficult for them to move around your backyard because they're really built to be kind of immobile um, and gain a lot of weight. So um, they might not be such a great choice for backyard chicken varieties. Um, but there are lots of different varieties. In this picture, I have the same breed of chicken, but one is a standard size variety and the other one is a bantam size variety. Um, here's one more look at the exact same breed, just two different size varieties. Um, those can have their benefits. <laughs> um, one obviously is a bigger chicken, but they tend to be more timid, slow moving. Your smaller ones tend to be more faster, a little bit more flighty, spracky. Um, but the other major difference is the size eggs that they lay. Um, the bantam chickens, the smaller chickens, will lay these little teeny tiny um, eggs. And then your more standard size chickens will lay the bigger eggs. Um, and it just boils down to preference. But obviously, if you go with the smaller size eggs, that obviously, um, <laughs> sorry, um, that obviously, I'm sorry, <laughs> my son is getting a drink right now. Um, so the smaller size chicken eggs, you would uh, need obviously more of those in order to have um, the equal to one regular size chicken egg. But for some people, they prefer the smaller ones. So it's definitely an option. Um, this is another view of what standard size eggs as opposed to bantam size eggs look like. Um, it's just the size difference. It doesn't have um, any difference as far as nutritional value. It's just how much egg is in each um, in each shell. And this is just a view of a bunch of different types of eggs so that you can kind of see where chicken eggs rank in the chart. Um, but the far right egg is your standard size chicken egg. And if you look all the way to the left, the second row in, that's a bantam size chicken egg. So um, they are small, but they are not the smallest of all the chicken eggs um, out there. And here are a bunch of different varieties. Now, these are certainly not the full scope of um, how many chicken varieties there are. But these are some of the most popular for backyard chicken eggs. Um, and this chart kind of breaks it down and talks about how heavy they are, how hardy that they can be through winter settings, depending on where you live. Um, and then it even breaks down how many times you can expect to get an egg from um, a chicken of these breeds. So, um, moving on, here's another chart where you can kind of have an idea of how many eggs you can get in a year. So um, some places you can buy chickens, uh, you would have to check your local laws, but for the most part you have to buy several chickens in order to have a backyard flock. And if you do, these are the types of numbers for chicken eggs that you're looking at getting from the standard breeds that you would find. And making sure that you get a breed that matches your lifestyle will help you not get overwhelmed with how many eggs that you might be getting. But also the types of breeds of chickens that you get 
um, all start laying eggs at different ages. And at the far right of this chart kind of breaks that down for you. Um, and this is an example of all the different colors of chicken eggs that you can get. So not only can you be more specific about the size of the chicken, um, what color varieties that the actual bird looks like, but also you can select breeds that have these very interesting egg colors. And this is just a very small sampling of what actually is out there. But these are some of the most popular ones. Um, but the breed of chicken determines the egg color. So here's another example of some breeds of chickens and the different egg colors you can get, um, which could range anywhere from a very dark chocolate brown to a white. And then you have these beautiful green and blue hues in between. Um, I, I love these. <laughs> And so now that we talked about that, I'm going to start rounding this up and kind of talk about um, how interesting the, the color changes are. Some people have asked me, does the color of the eggs affect the taste of the egg? And no, it doesn't. Um, the color of the egg is affected um, by, again, the breed of chicken and anything that you see that is not white. As it is passed through the oviduct, that chicken system will slowly add pigments to the, to the shell of the eggs. However, blue eggs are formed um, inside of the oviduct and the, the inside and the outside of the shell is the blue color. So that is unlike chickens with brown eggs, which the brown coloration happens later in the development cycle, but only the outside of that egg is actually brown. But chickens that lay brown eggs tend to be larger and they require more food um, in order to make an egg. And that's oftentimes why it costs more to buy brown eggs in the grocery store than white ones. But I know that was a really quick run through of kind of backyard chicken eggs. Um, but if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to run over those with you. Um, Thanks for listening. <laughs> yeah, Michelle, that was so interesting. I know I have questions. I wanted to mention Denise said that she won first place in the county fair with her Australorp as a teen. I think that's awesome. That's, that's so awesome. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So how many chickens do you have? So I live in a neighborhood in the smack middle of Arkansas, and I have seven backyard chickens. Um, we're not allowed to have roosters here, which I did want to make sure to heavily specify to always check your local laws as it pertains to whether or not you can have backyard chickens. Um, but where I live, I can't have a rooster. So I just have seven female backyard chickens, mostly of all different breeds. <laughs> and like if a person wanted to like start having, you know, setting up a little coop and having something if they can in their neighborhood, like, um, what would you suggest a person do? Like, get a little coop? How much do you think they should invest in starting? Well, anytime that you get into um, any animal, really, you want to make sure that you do your research and that you're buying quality products. Um, because the coop that you buy for your chickens is going to have to be outside in sustained weather. And there are a lot of cheaper options that will just attract ants and mold and, um, and nobody really wants that. So um, making sure that you invest in quality products on the, the front end is very important, but also the size of your flock that you plan on keeping gravely impacts how big of a coop that you wanna have. Um, so to put into a cost perspective, I have seven backyard chickens and I invested $400 into the chicken coop that they live in. And uh, that's a pretty reasonable price, in my opinion, for, for a good quality coop that 
will help not only keep your your chickens out of the elements but keeping wildlife because they are a um a, a, a vulnerable species to keep so you have to make sure that they're nice and secure so a coop is not something that you want to cheap out on um, and the same thing with the chickens that you want to buy i usually tell people to try to um raise your own flock of chickens that you get from good reputable sources um, as opposed to getting adult chickens elsewhere because they can have problems or they could be old and nearing the end of their life and you wouldn't necessarily have a positive experience but if you raise them then you know how old they are and you'll get the most out of their life while they're around and it's a really great way how to set your roots to sustain or to create a good substantial uh, flock and um they're also pretty amazing too because for people that do go out and get these backyard chickens uh, you could save some money on paying for their food because they will pretty much eat any scrap that you have. Um, most chicken people I know keep a bucket next to the sink and they will fill those with scraps um, and offer those to the chickens. So their overall long-term cost can be quite minimal. It's just the upfront costs that really get kind of expensive, but just as long as you do it correctly to make sure that um, safety is your focus. Great. No, thanks, Michelle. That's awesome. And when you say backyard chicken, um, do you have an area besides the coop that they get to kind of roam in? And how, like, do you have to fence that up pretty well? Or what are you, how are the chickens hanging out in your backyard? Well, um, chickens are actually um, such a, a wonderful animal to work with, truly. Um, and they can be really flexible whether or not you have a backyard. It really just kind of depends where you live. Prior to where I live now, I lived where we did not have the fenced in property, um, but I had about an acre and a half of land and my chickens know where their coop is and naturally they stay in the vicinity close to their coop for safety reasons. Um, and for that reason, um, they have a natural instinct to roost at night. Um, and as soon as it starts to get dark out, they all make their way back into their chicken coop and put themselves up. So containment really kind of has a lot to do with where you live. Um, but where I live currently, I do have a privacy fenced in backyard. But like I said, I live in a neighborhood, so it's not a very big backyard. Um, but I do allow them to come out of their coop and forage around the backyard, which helps keep the bug population around here at an absolute minimum. They'll eat the spiders, the ticks, the um, grasshoppers or whatever is running around in the yard, they'll eat that. Um, they eat the weeds in the yard. Um, they fertilize the ground. They scratch up the top of the soil and help aerate all of that. So there's tons of benefits to allowing them just to forage and be themselves on your property. Um, so yes, the term backyard chickens would ideally pertain to chickens that you could allow to enjoy your backyard. Awesome. That's so interesting. I've always wanted to, never had the chance, but you inspire me so much. Yeah, and maybe <laughs> others too. I, I think that some neighborhoods, I've seen things pop up recently about, you know, the uh, county deciding, okay, you guys can around this boundary have two chickens or whatever. And yeah, so I'm, I really want to find out more for my neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I've noticed lately the backyard chickens have started becoming very, very popular. Um, and a lot of people um, that get into backyard chickens maybe don't really know where to start. And that's where they have bad experiences. But for people that you don't have to be very physically able in order to have chickens either. Um, I find them extremely therapeutic. Um, I go outside, I give them treats, and it's just really nice to watch them just scratch around the yard, do their thing. They're not hurting anybody. They're, um, my chickens will come right up to you, let you pick them up, pet them. Um, a thing that a lot of people don't know is that chickens can actually be trained. 
um, and they are extremely intelligent. They could tell the difference between colors and they can um, play piano. Um, a common chicken toy is the xylophone. Um, and it's just really fun to get to have that interaction, but you don't necessarily have to be, you know, a farmer, able-bodied. You can be older, you could be younger. It's wonderful for families with children and, and people that live alone. Um, it's just a really great hobby that has a, a considerable benefit to it all around that might really help um, improve somebody's life. Mm. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle. Does anyone have any uh, questions for her before we move on? Uh, yeah, okay. It's been kind of quiet, but I think uh, you, it was super informative. And yeah, I might bug you in the future once I get my chickens. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You do. I need all the pictures. Okay. Yay. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, Michelle. Okay. So next, I believe we are going to go on to our. Um, oh, I skipped announcements. If I, maybe we can talk about announcements a little bit later. Um, so if you have any announcements, maybe we can put them in the chat and talk about them. Oh, you know, we'll just move that down the road a little bit. We're going to go into breakout rooms next. Um, so this is a chance for you to go ahead and uh, hang out with some other Kansas City Oasians. And um, yeah, if you decide to stay here and just chill, uh, please uh, mute yourself. Thanks.
Okay, so it looks like everybody has returned from their chat room. I hope that you had a nice chat with other community members. Um, we're gonna move on to our music guest again. Uh, if Dylan Guthrie can uh, give us another groovy tune, that would be awesome. We'd love to hear hey. it. Hey, howdy. Uh, hey guys, I'm back. I've kind of had a crazy last 45-ish minutes. My power went out. Sorry, I'm talking on online here. You're good. No, I'm sorry. I'm 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 working right now, online. I'm sorry. Anyway, so now I'm outside, and uh, we're hanging out. Um, uh, so forgive me. Someone was asking me for a cigarette. So, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, power went out. Now I'm outside. I'm gonna play you guys some music. And, uh, this is a song called uh, "So Long." So long. I ain't felt this way in so, so long. I'm hoping I can wrap my tools before the music's gone. I'm hoping I remember all my songs. So long. I ain't felt this way in so, so long. I'm hoping I can write my tunes before the music's gone. I'm hoping I remember all my songs. It isn't fair to stand it in the clouds to see my friends just standing there. The wind allows my brain to feel the tired air. It's blown too long and cut me in its stand. But I don't care. So long. I ain't felt this way in so, so long. I'm hoping that I can wrap my tunes before this music starts. I'm hoping I remember all my songs. Well, a bird awaits my desperate, hungry spirit at those times of perfect days. If song into my soul would seem to indicate that surely there must be a better way today. So long. I ain't felt this way in so, so long. I'm hoping I can write my tunes before this music's gone. I'm hoping I remember all my songs. I'm hoping I remember all my songs. I'm hoping I remember all these songs. There's that one. Hey. Thank you for yeah. giving the tumultuous beginning there. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Thank you, Dylan. Everybody yeah. appreciates your music. If you haven't, give some claps out to Dylan on our Skype. Yeah. Okay, so we'll yes. we'll uh, hear from you in a little bit at the end today. So thanks for hanging in there. Yes, um, hopefully my power will be back on so I can go back okay. inside. Yeah, fingers uh, crossed. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyways. Appreciate okay, it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we're going to move on and talk with Emma Mortaboy. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit about her before um, she uh, talks with us. This is, I think, going to be super interesting for us. So um, Emma Mortaboy is a part of APOPO, A-P-O-P-O, -O, for over 20 years, A-P-O-P-O, APOPO, scent detection animals have been detecting land mines and tuberculosis. You can find out more about APOPO and their amazing deminers, demeanor, yeah, probably deminers, yes, hero rats and hero dogs at www.apopo.org. During this short talk, APOPO's public fundraising officer, Emma Mortaboy, will give you an opportunity to learn more about APOPO's work and the hero rats and hero dogs. Emma has a background in fundraising and marketing management. 
is passionate about the natural world and human welfare and has recently completed a second degree in natural sciences. Emma started work for Apopo uh, at the beginning of this year and has and having traveled to West Africa and seen the African giant poached rats firsthand, she was already aware of Apopo's work and is very excited to spread the word. Emma is based in the UK and can be reached via email on emma.mortaboy.apopo.org. And I'm gonna put that in the chat right now so people can uh, get to that if they need to. Okay, Emma, I think I got everything. Would you like to begin? Yeah, so hi everyone. I'm just gonna share my, can everyone see my screen? Yeah? So a good start. So as mentioned, yeah, I'm the public fundraising officer for Popo. I started in February of this year, so I'm still quite green, but I'm very, very delighted to be here today. So thank you very much for the invitation. It's so much to cram in, so I'll try and whiz through as quickly as I can, and um, then hopefully have some time for some questions. So a Popo trains African giant pouch rats um, to detect tuberculosis, TB, and landmines. We also train hero dogs. So they are hero rats. We also have hero dogs, and they are Belgian Malinois. They help expedite the landmine clearance. So landmines and tuberculosis are both global humanitarian health crises. The key thing that actually binds them is that they can actually both be detected through olfaction, so through the scent of smell. Bart Wheatjens, so how did it all start? So our founder, Bart Wheatjens, was studying at Antwerp University, studying product design, actually. Um, as a teenager, he'd kept pet rats. He'd actually bred them for pet shops and for his friends. He knew how smart, sociable, intelligent, and how amazing their sense of smell was. He, during his course, traveled to Angola and Mozambique. It was during that time that he saw firsthand the impact of landmines, particularly on children. And everywhere he looked, there were these rats everywhere considered a pest. And the idea came to him. So he and Christoph Cox set up, and he's our current CEO, set up a popo in 1997. A year later, they set up our headquarters in Tanzania. So our operational headquarters is still in Tanzania. And obviously we operate globally in our efforts to get in landmine clearance and tuberculosis detection is in Africa. Um, we have a Swiss foundation and we also have a US foundation. So our mission and values, effectively, we want to deploy the most efficient and cost effective landmine solution so that we can remove landmines from the world. We also want to accelerate tuberculosis diagnosis. And more than that as well, we have a huge team of academics continually researching our hero rats and seeing whether or not there are other applications that they can be used for. So just try and move on. So why rats? <laughs> Everyone thinks it's really quirky. They have the most amazing sense of smell. So they can detect something a meter away and up to 20 centimeters buried in the ground. So that's critical. But the most critical thing, because lots of people seem to think that we have kamikaze rats and we're sending them off to set off landmines. And it's not the case. They are too light to set off the landmines. They take about a year to 18 months to train. It costs about 6,000 euros to, cha to train a hero rat. That's just for the training. So their lifespan being six to eight years was a real benefit as well, because obviously investing all of that time, um, we can obviously get quite a long working life out of the animals as well. They're everywhere in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's a sustainable local resource, considered actually a pest by a lot of people. Uh, they're easy to transport and they're also very adaptable. So multiple hand handlers can actually work with the rats, which is really important. So their Latin name is Christomese and Sorgai. They are found, as I say, all across sub-Saharan Africa. They're omnivorous, mainly nocturnal, which is really important actually, because we work to their schedule. So there are hero rats. And if they don't want to work during the day, then we have an early start. So all of our demining teams across the world will get up at 4 a.m., 5 a.m. so that they can work about half an hour just in the mornings, very early mornings um, in the landmine detection. 
So in terms of size, they range between 25 and 35 centimeters in length, the males being larger than the female. And this is the critical part in terms of their weight. So they weigh a maximum of one and a half kilos and it takes five kilograms to set off a landmine. In terms of animal welfare, obviously I think I've said all that, they are at the heart of everything that we do. I wouldn't work at a popo if any animals were in harm's way at all. We absolutely adore our hero animals. Um, we have a comprehensive animal welfare policy and um, that's all adheres to the um, World Organization for Animal Health and Wellbeing. In terms of their care, you can see here, this is their kennels. This is their, this is their weekly diet. It looks like they live off sort of various different um, fruits and vegetables being omnivorous at the weekends. They get treated. <laughs> so they have lots of sardines and nuts. They are fed sort of using um, syringes um, during the week and during training. So they sort of like mash up avocado and banana and it's kind of like their clicker reward. So we train them through kind of detection and then reward. Um, they get daily enrichment and, and exercise. Their kennels completely replicate their natural environment. So we have soil for them to dig in. There are play pots. There's lots of opportunities for them to nest. There are toys um, in there, but the most important thing is that they're nocturnal. So if you go to Tanzania, it's really funny because all around the kennels, everyone has to be super, super quiet. <laughs> during the day we must not disturb our hero rats they get they need a good day sleep so in terms of the bedding we give them non-aromatic softwoods so that means they have never have any respiratory issues whatsoever and they have daily health checks from animal health officers and a weekly health check uh, health check sorry from a veterinarian we keep records on every single one of our animals and one of the brilliant things about the particular species of rat as well is because they are endemic to sub-Saharan Africa, they're highly resistant to tropical diseases. They don't need any vaccinations. The only vaccination they need is for rabies. So seven years ago, we actually exported and they traveled for the first time our hero rats out of Africa and they work in Cambodia. So they have, that's a very similar environment in terms of climate. So they're able to work in that environment. Um, and in that instance, that all they need is a rabies vaccination and regular deworming. So very, very easy to look after. And the critical thing, so never has an animal or human actually for that matter, matter ever been harmed in a popo's operations. So, Coming on to when they do, we have now been running long enough, not for our hero dogs, but for certainly for our hero rats, for some of them to reach their retirement age. We get lots of people asking whether or not they can adopt a hero rat and take them home um, and look after them. We do actually, in some circumstances for our hero dogs, we will we'll probably allow that, but actually we don't with our hero rats. They retire to their home pen and they get to hang out with their siblings and their friends. And it's a you should see the pen, it's absolutely ginormous. It replicates an entirely natural environment. They still get fed an amazing diet. They still get their daily health checks. If an animal becomes very sick, then they are obviously humanely euthanized. Usually a rat will kind of slow down and start indicating to their handlers that they're just kind of not so keen to work. And it's at that point that they are just retired to their home cage. But it's actually fairer for them to stay in their original country and, and not be exported out and rehomed as it were. And they're really well looked after. If they've given their lives to us, a popo, then we make sure that their retirement is amazing. The landmine problem is a huge problem. So it affects 60 countries. Uh, there were almost 6,000 accidents in 2019. The report actually came out for last year and um, I'll update you, perhaps send on some statistics. The most tragic thing about all of this is that almost half of accidents, that's 43% involved children, they had nothing to do with the war. They're completely innocent victims. Um, and apart from obviously the horrific injuries that are involved in the danger to life from landmines, there's also a barrier for people to reach their potential. So people can't farm their lands. Children can't walk to school safely. They can't play around their certain areas um, safely. So it's a barrier for people, you know, to start making money. And 
One of the key things is that approximately three, just 3% 3 of a suspected landmine um, field or area will actually contain landmines. So the whole process of just even declaring land landmine free still takes the same amount of effort. So it can be a really long process. It was in 1997 that the Ottawa Treaty reached the Manbind Convention. So this prevents the use, stock and exchange of landmines. So there is a deadline for 2025. Um, the aim is to remove all landmines by that time. Unfortunately, not every country <clears throat> has signed up to that agreement, but APOPO is absolutely dedicated and we continue in our battle to reach that deadline. We use an integrated approach. So our hero rats are phenomenal, but we do still need to potentially clear land. I'll talk about our hero dogs later on because that's sort of tied in. Um, and when a rat has indicated that there is an explosive, we still have humans that are absolute heroes as well. And they will come in and they will actually either dig out and manually remove, or they will detonate the landmine as well. So it is an integrated approach, but the key thing about our rats is that actually they can search an area of 200 square meters in 30 minutes, which would take a D minor with a metal detector four days. So that 30 minutes in the morning is well worth it and equivalent to somebody spending four days out in the field. And also, you know, obviously putting themselves at risk. So our, our rats will never set the landmines off, whereas humans working in an, even in a methodical way still have the potential to set off the landmines. Another really, really important factor is that with our hero rats and our hero dogs, they do not, they're not trained to um, detect metal, they're trained to detect uh, TNT or explosives, and that is it. So you're not futilely digging up, you know, pieces of discarded metal um, and wasting time. Also, a lot of improvised bombs, particularly in certain areas, they don't necessarily contain metal and it would just be an explosive in there. So our rats are 100% accurate in detecting explosives and are actually going to be more efficient than any metal detector as well. We'll start with a really good news story. So Apopo started work in Mozambique in 2007. We cleared almost 6 million square meters of land and on the 17th of September 2015, Mozambique was declared completely landmine free. So that's brilliant. And then we continue, I'm going to whiz through because there's so much to say and you have questions, please ask. But we currently now are working in Angola and in Cambodia. And in Cambodia, this is um, where our hero dogs came to the fore. So we worked with UNESCO or are working with UNESCO to clear prayer over here. Now, this is an ancient Kaima Hindu temple, and actually a lot of areas within different regions of Cambodia are considered sacred. Um, we don't want to be taking scrub and bushes. And one thing I should mention about clearing land, we never, ever cut down trees. We only cut grass and bush and sort of scrub land. And you go back six months later and all of that greenery is returned. But in these sorts of important UNESCO heritage sites, we don't want to be disrupting any land or cutting at all. Our technical survey dogs will instead go through, work in any environment, through any kind of brush or shrub and declare land free really, really rapidly. So how our dogs work, they have, I don't know if you can see here, this is Cyclone and he has a backpack. Each of our hero dogs has a, a smart backpack and the dogs are trained to sit one meter away from the explosive. So yes, they are heavier, but they are not trained to go near it. They are trained to sit one meter away from the scent of an explosive. And that sitting points the backpack up and then the handler has a sort of um, a smartphone and it can GPS track all of the different explosives that the technical survey dog has found. And at that point, we just clear a very small section and we can bring in our hero rats for a micro search at that point. The dogs never injured again because they are trained to stay well away from explosives, but they speed up operations phenomenally. So they're now actually working in South Sudan. And um, I think I can say this, but looking very, it's very, looking very, very close to our, our work being um, taken on in Turkey as well and various other regions, but certainly Turkey. 
this is um, also quite important. So we've talked about the people and the impact on humans. Uh, Popo have also been tasked to clear, this is one of the world's largest conservation areas. It's a 37 kilometer border in the Sengwe um, Wildlife Corridor. Now, every single year elephants, amongst other species, the elephants are very, very clever. So this is why I'm talking about elephants specifically because they're maimed and they're injured and they learn to avoid the landmines. In avoiding the landmines, they can become closer and come into contact with humans, which can cause animal and human conflicts. So this is a really, really important factor that, you know, for us as an organization, animal welfare is really important as well. So we want to be able to stop any injuries to wildlife. So we're quite excited about that one. So our impact to date, our hero rats and hero dogs have found 108,736 landmines or unexploded ordnance. That's what the UXO stands for. They've cleared over 25 million square meters. And the thing I love is the impact on the people. So that is a million people freed from the threat of explosives. So if you think about those million people, that is children that can now go to school, children that can now play freely. That's the family that can farm in their land. They can produce stuff, sell it at the market. That's transformative for a million people. In terms of TB detection, so before COVID, the C word, um, TB was the world's most deadliest respiratory illness. Um, one of the sort of more scary statistics in this is that about a quarter of a million children die from TB every year. Um, these statistics obviously probably pale a little bit in comparison to COVID, but it's still a really important area. Um, and in guidelines um, for the World Health Organization, we work very closely with the World Health Organization because TB is something that is preventable and can be tackled. The traditional method of actually visualizing or assessing whether somebody has tuberculosis is to get the patient to produce a sputum sample. That's then we grow the culture and then visualize the, um, that under a microscope. When you're talking about underdeveloped countries, we have issues potentially with electricity. We have issues with internet and not being able to get software updates. There, the clinic facilities may not be necessarily up to par. It's you know, also very difficult potentially for patients to come in and then actually track that patient as well because of the kind of environments and the rural nature of where these patients live. And even when microscopy is working at its very, very best, it still misses a third of tuberculosis samples. So yes, this is, sorry, we run the test. So in collaboration with national health authorities, we actually now work with clinics in Ethiopia, Tanzania and Mozambique in terms of a 24 hour model. So what happens is the patient will give their sputum samples to their local clinic. Um, <clears throat> all of those samples are tested using microscopy. And then we pay for a motorcyclist and we have an army of motorbikes. They go and collect every single one of those samples and they take it back to our hero rat laboratories. And our hero rats will then scan all of those samples. They will confirm the positives that have already been found. But the key thing is they find additional positives. Um, the results are returned within 24 hours back to the clinics. And that's when the clinics take over patient care in collaboration with a popo so a high throughput a again showing this to be efficiency a hero rat can check 100 samples in 20 minutes um that could take a lab te technician up to four days so i don't know if you can see sort of it's sort of quite a long glass perspex kind of kennel and you slide in the tuberculosis samples and they're little holes and they go along and they sniff when they know there is tuberculosis there, they will indicate and they will confirm the positives that have already been found and also find the additional ones. I'll come on to that bit in a minute. When the positives go back into the clinic, a popo works really, really closely with usually ex-patients, um, recruiting them in a volunteering capacity and working ourselves with actually tracking patient care. As I talked about before, it's difficult sometimes in rural communities. That's why we have to do work really quickly, get that 24 hour result. So the patient has 
the information, they have tuberculosis, and then we can start treatment. And it's really important that treatment is seen through. It takes six months for them to complete the treatment. So that's why it's crucial that we continue to see that patient through. Now this, I love this graph. I love graphs anyway. But <clears throat> on the uh, y-axis here, you can see the percent of increase by detection of our hero rats. So as you can see here for the younger age group, one to five, our hero rats actually detect 67% more uh, positive samples than just microscopy alone, which is phenomenal. And I think we think that's because that actually children struggle to bring up the, the sputum sample adequately, and also that the bacterial load in that sample is potentially lower. Now, when you're trying to visualize that under a microscope, you're not going to be able to, but our hero rats and their sense of smell will miss nothing. Um, one thing to add, actually, it's really important, is that the tuberculosis is heated, it's denatured, so it's still got all of the odour, but it's not harmful or transmissible to our hero rats. So the average, when you average out across all age groups, is that our hero rats actually have raised the case detection rate by 40%, um, which is phenomenal. So that actually means almost <clears throat> excuse me, 20,000, that's 19,535 additional TB patients found. Um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, getting a cough in my TB bit. <laughs> um, going on the basis that one patient with tuberculosis will infect a further three, that's actually over 150,000 tuberculosis cases prevented. So it's phenomenally efficient as well. Everyone thinks that the rats are really quirky, but the rats are more than that. It's incredibly vital. So this year, again, you know, obviously with COVID, we have actually been working to be part of the answer. So we have lots of academics working in Tanzania and across the world, and we have been actually running tests to see whether or not our hero rats can detect COVID. I'm not in a position to give the results of that just now, but what I can say is that we help very much on the front line throughout the whole pandemic. So our motorcyclists um, were couriering COVID samples from laboratories to clinics and helping in whatever way that we could on the ground in Africa. And also as part of our tuberculosis education, we already give people the advice on hygiene and social distancing, but that became more important than ever this year. We also distributed masks and hand sanitizer. So research and innovation. So this is kind of, we're constantly making sure that everything that we're doing right now is good and, it, and it's working well. So that our standard operating procedures are you know, absolutely finely tuned but we want to build on that science. And one of the really, really interesting things um, is understanding, I think, what molecular prop property or chemical substance it is or signature that is there both in tuberculosis and in TNT. Because if we can absolutely pinpoint that, not only do we understand the rats better, but we actually can have the ability to create electronic sniffers, make a, a situation where it's even more efficient globally for people to be able to just actually run these tests and actually find that molecular signature. So we're doing a lot of work on that at the moment. And we're also, I think this actually is one of the tuberculosis. Yeah, so this is one of the kennels. It gives you an idea of the tuberculosis sort of uh, setup for sampling and testing. Um, but we're also looking at their personalities. So we're trying to see whether or not from a young age, a rat indicates whether or not they're going to make a, an amazing mind detection rat or an amazing tuberculosis detection rat. So we're constantly looking at their behavior and seeing whether or not there's indications as to whether or not, you know, we've got a super sniffer over here or this one's definitely going to be working in tuberculosis. Um, these applications are really exciting. So these are things that... Um, I'm super excited about. So we're training our hero rats and they've passed the first tests and they can detect pangolin scales. They can detect pangolin scales disguised in all manner of scents, coffee, hidden in the bottom of shipping containers, wrapped up, you know, disguised in many, many odors. And they've passed all of the tests to do that. They're now working on rhino horn, um, elephant tusks and hardwoods. So we're working to use our hero rats so that we can prevent wildlife trafficking. Really super important. Obviously, might in the future include other contraband as well. 
other pathogens and diseases. I've just talked about COVID. Um, we've had some successful first um, results in from also being able to detect other viruses such as HPV, but that's shifted slightly now and we're focusing, as everyone is, on COVID. Um, but this particular video I'll leave you with, and this is one of the upcoming applications that I'm super excited about. If I can move this and uh, press play. <coughs> Okay, I think that's 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 me. That was the rescue rats. I am very excited about the rescue rats, I have to say. <laughs> But I think I can stop sharing my screen and, and just take any answers, uh, sorry, any questions that you might have. I just have to say rats with backpack on, you know, scampering around and yeah, two way, yeah, camera, that is too cute. I, I, you know, if anything, you fall in love with them just by that little video and yeah, no, they are awesome. And I'm totally watching Ratatouille tonight too. I'm just all about, and it's, this is such a good day for chickens and rats, I think, so. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Okay, so there are some questions. Um, I think Lisa had, yeah, okay. So for anyone that needed to know that, what the abbreviation stands for, Andy was able to put it up in chat. So go go ahead and you can read through that. Um, it doesn't translate exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but that's great. And then Dave asks, um, do the rats have a known false negative rate? No, so they don't detect anything because they have been trained essentially to, when they discover the tuberculosis bacteria, they get a reward. There isn't a reward unless there is. I mean, during the, their training takes a very long period of time, um, a year minimum, 18 months. And so they're not gonna be picking out anything. Somebody asked us this recently, whether or not they were just sort of saying, yeah, there's something there just to get the food. Mm -hmm. But then everything is sent off and it's tested again um, using who endorsed methods. So, you know, we're very, very stringent on quality control. We've not got any sneaky rats trying to get the food for no, for no reason. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, okay, working, uh, another, uh, Andy asks, uh, working dogs not only enjoy their work, but also enjoy wearing their working uniform. Do the rats need to be trained to enjoy their working gear or do they naturally take to it? You know, I think they naturally take to it because we socialize. I mean, from four weeks old, they're left with their mums until they are four weeks old. And from that point onwards, we undergo a huge amount of socialization. So they're incredibly adaptable. Um, there are lots and lots of people that keep them as pets. 
pests as well. And, you know, kind of, I think you have mixed results when you try and keep them as pets. I wouldn't necessarily condone that because our handlers are specialized in being able to kind of, you know, socialize them in the correct way and get them used to the harnesses and the backpacks. And actually it's really sweet. We have, um, I can't remember the lady's name. One thing that's amazing about Popo is that 50% of our D miners are, are women. So we have 50% men and 50% women as well. So we're all about gender equality. It's really important to us. And it is one of our female um, D miners and she actually hand makes all of the harnesses and so, so it's so, so cool. They're, made awesome. pleasure. They're really comfy. <laughs> oh. oh, okay. Another question just came up. What is the longest time a hero rat has worked before retirement? I think about seven years. Seven years is uh, is the maximum, and I think uh, we I don't know if anybody saw last year, but uh, Magawa who won the PDSA gold medal, so one of our hero rats won a like a sort of the equivalent of the Victoria Cross for animals last year, which was so exciting, um, and he's been working now for about seven years. So we're looking at retiring. Him. You heard it here first. We're looking at retiring him this year. So yeah. Okay. Um, I'm curious about how a rat detects like what is you know a, a dog points i mean you know when we think about them detecting something what does the rat do how does one know that a mine is there so they actually all have different personalities and they are quite unique so they have like little balls we're trying to train them at the moment to kind of like ring a little bell um around their neck but that is more for future applications so in the rescue rats for example or finding contraband and we might not be able to visualize or see where the rat is we can kind of locate or what have you um they quite often will just scratch the earth and that is the indication but each one's slightly different and if you go out there a handler you will you'll see a rat scratch the earth and you'll say oh I think he's found something no 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 because I know my rat that's not how he indicates he likes to groom himself it's really strange they're all very unique but the way that they indicate remains consistent and the handlers know them really intimately well so it, it kind of varies sorry or direct no no, no that's that's so interesting I mean that their personality is linked to the way that they're going to show you yeah, that's so cool. Okay. Okay. So are there any other questions um, for Emma? This has been so interesting. I had no idea rats were so smart. And yeah, I'm I'm considering rats in a totally new way. Yeah, put, Maureen says this was very cool. Yeah, I totally agree. I put um, the um, URL in. Okay, yeah, that's great. Okay. Okay, well, if there are any and uh, no other questions, um, I guess that's great. Thank you so much, Emma. This was so cool. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. We can maybe we can give some claps out to Emma. Thanks again. Okay, awesome. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so um, let's see one second, guys. Okay, uh, great. Okay. So um, a few things I'd like to tell you about Oasis before we move on to our musical guest. So um, just so you know, uh, Oasis is a 501c3 nonprofit organization we, and we are re entirely volunteer staffed and donation funded. Our program today is just part of the wide range of informational, educational and motivational speakers we offer most Sundays. If you appreciate what you've heard and seen, please consider making a donation. And there are several ways you can donate. Uh, we are credit and debit card, don't, we have credit and debit card donations that you can text. I can copy that into the chat for you. Okay. And um, uh, we also have, you can also have recurring weekly or monthly donations that can be set up online through Simple Give. If you go to our website at kcoasis.org and click on donate at the top of the home page. I know uh, my family really loves to use Smile through Amazon. And, um, you know, even when we're feeling a little guilty ordering something from Amazon, at least we know a percentage always goes to KC Oasis. So that feels awesome to do that too. Okay, so um, we're going to go ahead and move on to our um, awesome musical uh, 
performer today. And um, so let's hear one last time from Dylan Guthrie. Thanks for coming back and uh, playing for us to end our meeting today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, shout out to Emma. That was something else. I was really astounded, frankly. I had no idea what I was getting myself into with that presentation, but it was quite fascinating. Goodness gracious. And I just want to say one more time, uh, just uh, thank you to Oasis for having me. And also thank you to Lisa, Julie, and Andrew for sending me some money in my virtual tip jar on Venmo. That's really appreciated. Anyways, just signing off. We'll just take a look at my dog real quickly. That's Elvis. Anyways, and now... I will play one last song. This one um, is about my grandpa, actually. He passed pancreatic cancer two years ago now. Fought it for a long time, though. Anyways, song kind of about, you know, some, spending some time with him at the end of there. All right. It's called uh, Blue Eyes, Green Water. <laughs> He said, they're right out in front of me, staring at the great beyond, always reminded of love, reminded of song. themselves and maybe give one last clap out to uh, Dylan. That'd be awesome. Thank you so much, Dylan. 
Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dylan. Thank you for this day. I learned a lot. Great job. Great job. Great job. Great job. And thanks. I had another tip roll in there. I didn't even see it was from, but thank you very much. Like, seriously, I really appreciate that. And uh, not expected, but I appreciate the generosity. So thank you. And uh, weekend or week, rest of it, whatever's yeah. left, I should say. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thanks again. Hope you come back soon. Yeah. yeah thank you. Okay. Bye. Okay. All right. So, everyone, I hope you all have a good um, uh, rest of your week. We'd like to thank. Michelle and uh, Emma also for coming today and uh, teaching us a lot about chickens and rats. This was so cool. Um, yeah, take care, everybody. Um, and we'll see you next week.